Okay, we're good. So, uh, big round of applause for the last talk of the day. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Hello. Yeah, that's like that. <laughs> it's really amazing to see the room full of people, even even though this is the last talk, the last session, and, and the last day of the conference. So thank you and welcome. So this is uh, a collaborative work uh, from my uh, colleagues and supervisor from uh, Athens University of Economics and Business. So all the good part you are seeing going, going to see today is all belongs to them. All the problems that you may say, mm, what is that? You can point to me. And uh, well, let's start. So what we are going to talk about, we will discuss about smells, code smells, and some earlier, uh, earlier speakers have made my job a little easier, so I'll, I'll probably skip those parts very quickly. So we'll talk about smells. We'll talk about how people detect smells today. And we'll talk about how we tried to detect smells using deep learning. And I'll go a little bit in technical detail what we did and what kind of experimental setup we uh, put up and what kind of results we got. This is what we are going to do. Sounds good? Great. So before going to, into that, let me briefly talk about and uh, about myself and give a disclaimer that I'm not really a machine learning expert like most of you. I'm a soft engineering researcher. I'm completing my PhD in hopefully in a couple of weeks. So, uh, and these are the topics that I'm mostly working. So uh, refactoring, smells, code quality, these are the things that I mostly work with. Okay, so let's start with the term smell. Who coined the term smell? Any guesses? Yep. Should I, should I explain it? Or no, no, you just say who coined that term. Hmm. Anybody? Not really. Actually, the, coin, the term came up in the book by Martin Fowler, yeah. but it was coined by Kent Beck in 1999, in the famous Martin Fowler's book, because that chapter about smell was written, written co-written by Kent Beck. And they defined that uh, term very casually, like certain structures in the code that suggest sub or sometimes scream for the possibility of refactoring. And later on, and especially in the academic world, many people defined that term much more vigorously, and you can find all the definitions here. If you are interested in the smell catalog, I put together at least the known and uh, common smell. And right now, there are 264 smells belonging to different domains and subdomains of software. If you are interested, you can find that catalog here. So let me give some examples before I do, de delve into the detection part. So when we talk about smells, we can classify them based on the granularity, based on the scope, and based on the impact that they make. So the lowest granularity is the implementation smells, which you can uh, detect or you can sense just looking at, for example, a, a, a method. So magic number, complex method, or an empty catch block, these are the kind of smells that you can spot just looking at a method. The next granularity is design smells that are mostly uh, at a little higher granularity and when that kind of smell that you can detect by looking at this and the classes, abstractions, and the relationship among them. So examples are like multifaceted abstraction when a class is doing much more or realizing much more uh, responsibility or um, insufficient modularization, which means or more commonly known as God class. When you, <clears throat> when you see a software from components and the relationship among them at that granularity, you, you are, um, and, and you are detecting smells, you are uh, detecting architecture smells. And these examples are basically architecture smells. Got component or feature concentration. Feature concentration is nothing but 
a component is doing more than one. Scattered functionality is like a responsibility scattered across multiple components. So, how people are detecting so far smells? So, uh, there are basically five different categories if we try to analyze all the different smell detection uh, al algorithms or the methods available today. There are basically five different categories. Metric based, rules or heuristic based, machine learning based, optimization and history based. And most common ones are metrics and heuristics. And what people do normally, this is what people do. So you have source code, so and you prepare a source model out of that. Okay, that's not really working. Okay, so you prepare source model, and source model could be anything. Uh, a more simpler, uh, an example could be AST, abstract syntax tree. And from that source model, uh, you compute metrics, and then you apply a certain threshold to classify whether that smell uh, is present in, in that particular method or class or a component. Recently, some attempts have been made to detect smells using machine learning. And this is, a, again, a very high-level view what people do in, uh, when they want to detect smells using machine learning. So you have source code, and you again prepare some sort of a source model. You have a machine learning algorithm. Again, there are different kinds of machine learning algorithms that you may apply. There are some existing examples, especially I'm talking about super, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you have existing examples that you use to train the machine learning algorithms, and you have a trained model, and with that trained model, you actually uh, infer the new code that whether those uh, code snippets or code fragments are, can be classified as smells or non-smells. I would like to uh, brief about what kind of uh, existing academic work uh, has been done on uh, related to machine learning based approaches. So uh, people have used support vector machines, uh, bias and belief networks, log logistic regression, and even CNN. And for first three of them, uh, the feature set or the input is matrix, object-oriented matrix, typically. And uh, that's basically a double-edged sword. At one end, you are trying to help machine learning algorithm to uh, pick the uh, classification feature very quickly so that the algorithm can decide whether it's a smell or non-smell. But on the other hand, on the other hand, you are uh, you are reducing the search space, and uh, so that the the and you are limiting the capabilities of the, uh, of uh, machine learning or deep learning algorithm by by limiting the capabilities of that, because you are you are now giving only the matrix, so the machine learning algorithm is bound that can do at best what that machine that uh, metric can represent if the metric is not representing the feature or the characteristic that that is helpful in detecting that smell then well we are not going to get a good classifier another related problem uh, especially in the existing work is either the validation is th there are many details missing or if there is, there are uh, details are there, then the validation is on balanced samples. And we, in the morning also, we we have seen that when we have a balanced set versus imbalanced set, that can be really drastic change in the performance. If you, and if you are representing a realistic case in which you have maybe a, maybe one percent of classes are smelly and ninety nine percent classes are non smelly. Then and you apply some sort of a machine learning algorithm, and your precision recall curve will be like this. So that's uh, one of the observations that we had. And with this sort of background, uh, these two uh, major research questions that we set up for ourselves. The first one is: Is it really feasible or possible to apply deep learning to 
to detect smells. And if it is possible, then which method is um, performing superior? And uh, basically, we analyze CNN and RNN, and we give inputs in 1D and 2D. So we basically have three models to compare, CNN 1D, CNN 2D, and RNN. In the second research question, we are exploring whether transfer learning is feasible. And what is transfer learning? Transfer learning is nothing but a, uh, a, a technique where we exploit the commonalities between different learning tasks. So what we are going to do essentially is that we learn a uh, model from one programming language and then we apply that trained model to another programming language. Okay. So to do this, what we have done, we have a research question set of research questions that I already talked about. We downloaded source code. Obviously, our first approach, is, first step is to download source code, and GitHub is the to-go method. So we uh, downloaded C-sharp and Java repositories. We use DesignNight to detect smells in both of both kind of repositories. We use code split, uh, again, uh, our own tools that uh, we have made available. We, I'll share all the details uh, where you can find all these uh, tools. So we, we basically, we are generating code fragments from, the, from these uh, big projects. I'll go into each step individually also, so I'll go a little bit in more detail. This is just, I'm giving an overview. And then these code fragments and the detected smell, we basically classify these code fragments into positive and negative samples. And then we tokenize them. After tokenizing, we prefer a pre-processing, which is nothing but removing the duplicates. And then we finally give it to the deep learning models. This is the overall setup that we used. Let me go into a little bit in detail one by one. So we downloaded more than 1,000 repositories uh, containing c -sharp code. Uh, we selected 2,500 and, uh, and downloaded 100 repositories just for validation. We are using Java repositories just for validation, so we just downloaded 100 repositories. And how we selected these numbers, 1,000 and 2,500? We had uh, eight dimensions, uh, architecture, uh, continuous integration, unit tests, and so on and so forth. So we selected all the repositories that has at least six out of eight uh, positive uh, numbers, uh, favorable numbers in one of these dimensions. And star, number of stars, at least five. So we discarded everything which is less than five. With that, we got these kind of numbers and we downloaded the code. The second thing we did is that for each project, we need to split the big projects into individual uh, samples, individual fragments. An individual fragment could be a method when we are detecting uh, implementation smells and a class if we are detecting a design smell. So depending on that, we basically uh, split the, the code into either method or uh, class, and we put it put them in, in a separate files. Same, same thing we did for the Java. Next step is smell detection. We use Design Night and for both Design Night C sharp for C sharp code and for Java, uh, Design Night Java for Java code and detect a, uh, all the smells that can be found in the code. And by the way, Design Night is uh, a tool which can detect uh, 19 design smells, 7 architecture smells, and 11 implementation smells. And similarly, uh, Java, Design Night Java version is also picking it up to that level. You can download these tools, and again, uh, at the last slide, I will share all the links to you. So we know what kind of smells a project has, and we know uh, all the code fragments. So with these two pieces of information, we classify these code fragments either through a positive sample or to a negative sample. After that, we use tokenizer. 
to what tokenizer does basically takes a co code fragment and converts into integer tokens, a set of integer tokens. And to do that, uh, and in that context, there are two important things to mention. Tokenizer uh, is uh, defines um, specific ranges for specific tokens. For example, all the reserved keywords are always assigned the same token. And uh, all the uh, user-defined symbols are also specified or, spe or assigned a specific set or a specific range of tokens. The another effect about tokenizer is that it can, it, right now it supports six languages, including C Sharp and Java, which was, we were, uh, our subject systems. It looks like this. So if you have a very small uh, method, then if you uh, tokenize this method into 1D, it will look like as a 1D vector. And if you have a 2D uh, matrix, then it looks like something like this. And again, it's important to uh, go a little bit in more detail and see how we prepare the data, how we train the model. So that's why I'm showing you a very specific example of a smell. So this is a 5,000, approximately 5,000 uh, number of positive samples we have for a smell and three, more than 311,000 negative samples. So this is the, uh, you can see that it's a highly imbalanced uh, data. And that we split into 70-30 for 70 for training and 30 for validation. And what we do, uh, obviously we have 3,000 and we have a split, 70-30. And for training, we take this, uh, this uh, positive part and this negative part and similarly for the evaluation we do the same here we do when we train the model we do balanced training which means that we have equal number of positive and negative numbers samples so what we do basically we uh, discard anything extra that we have in in the with the with this particular part the negative part so we have equal number of positive and negative only for training for evaluation, we keep the ratio as it is. We don't change it. And we, uh, all the results that I'm going to show it on the, re uh, on the real world evaluation. And we selected four smells. All four smells are different kinds of smells. Three are implementation and one, in, one is design. So the complex method is uh, the method that has a high cyclometric complexity. Magic number is a numerical literal is used with in the expression without explanation. Empty catch block is a catch block of where the exception, uh, there is nothing written in that uh, catch block. And then multifaceted abstraction is a kind of, uh, kind of difficult to detect smell because, and that's why we chose it because it is, uh, it is a very different from the rest of three and and it, because it has a semantic meaning, you can't detect a multifaceted abstraction just looking at the code. You need to understand what it does, because what it means is uh, the cohesion of the class is low. So these are the four smells that we chose, and uh, now let's talk about what we did, how, what kind of uh, CNN we, uh, model or architecture we prepared with the CNN. So you can see that that we have a convolution, batch normalization, and max pooling layers, and these layers are repeated, are repeated in the sense uh, when we experimented with number of deep layers, and when we say deep layers, we only refer to these number of uh, deep layers, one, two, and three. So if uh, deep layer layers are equal to three, which means we repeat these three times. And we did a kind of a grid search, which means that we chose different kind of hyperparameters, and uh, we experiment with all the permutations and combination. And we use dynamic batch size depending on the input sample size. So if the number of samples are very small, then we use the smaller uh, batch size, but if the number of samples are very large, then we use the higher number of batches. To For the regularization, we use 
uh, early stopping with patients 5 so that we don't overfit and model checkpoint along with that. And some other configuration you can see here that dropout layer has a 0 0.1 uh, and dropout and, uh, and the dance has, uh, I mean, uh, the output is 32 with the ReLU activation and so on and so forth. Similarly, for RNN, we have LSTM layer and uh, before that we have embedding layer and we, when we have a number of layers, multiple uh, deep learning layers, we basically repeat this LSTM layer. Again, we have different kind of hyperparameters and uh, dynamic batch size and uh, same uh, and uh, similar size, uh, similar callbacks. Although we use patients too, because it is very expensive to train RNN model, and if time permits, I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. So essentially, what we did is we had two phases. In the first phase. We did a uh, grid search with the different kind of param uh, parameters, configurations. So we had uh, 144, 144 configurations for CNN and 18 for RNN. And we kept a validation set 20% aside for the first phase. In the second phase, when, when we know which, or, uh, which um, configuration works the best, we run it again with the validation zero, obviously. And we performed all the experiments on the on GNET facility, which is a Gleek supercomputing facility, uh, with the one GPU and 64 GB of uh, memory. So, what we got? What we got is, before I go into the uh, into what we got. The, when we were and and I said initially that we were very uh, we were very uh, uh, we started with very without any knowledge of machine learning. So the first thing that I did is uh, figuring out accuracy. So we I was computing accuracy, and the first time when I run the model and we I got 99% accuracy, and I was jumping, and I told my supervisor, see 99%. And he looked at me, hmm, you have imbalanced data, and huge imbalanced data. Obviously, you'll get 99%, even if your, uh, your model is just predicting one or zero. You'll, do, you'll get that. So then we learned that, okay, that's not the right way. So the first thing we added is uh, ROC, AUC. So this is the kind of ROC, AUC we got. So area under curve. Basically, this is what we got. So the, it, it's crossing 80% in some cases, and, and the lowest end, it's 50% or something like that. However, we again realized that this is not the right way. We should do precision recall and precision recall curves. And this is what we got for precision recall. And basically, we summarized precision recall into F1, uh, F measure, to have a comprehensive uh, one number. So uh, you, you can clearly see that some of the smells, these uh, deep learning architectures that we design can pick it up, but some they can't. And the reason in general F1 is, in, is low because we have low precision. And why we have low precision? Because we are predicting false positives, a lot of false positives. So well, we can optimize that whether whether we want high precision and recall, and probably you know better that precision and recall always have a trade-off. So if we want to get higher precision, we can have to compromise on the recall and vice versa. So that this is what the first result, and we go into a little bit on detail that whether CNN versus RNN. So whether CNN is better or RNN is doing better in our case. And we see, hmm, the, if you look at the maximum F1, there is hardly any difference. Uh, even uh, if we plot all the cases, then also it's not decide, decisively, we cannot say that whether CNN is better in our case or uh, CNN 2D is better. We also did comparison between CNN and RNN. Uh, I would not uh, consider this because 
in all the cases, uh, in all the three models, the performance was very low, so a point zero zero four or something. So, which means that it's not uh, it's not really uh, fair to compare point zero zero four and point zero zero six because it's a very uh, it will bring the multifold difference. However, the here, when RNN can detect something, it's doing very good. In case of complex method, it's not doing that great because probably it cannot capture the, the structural property of the method. However, in other cases, in these two cases, probably RNN is picking up that feature and that's why it's doing much better than the rest of the two models. Another experiment that we did is, is it beneficial to increase number of deep layers? And we, what we found is, well, in, for the second layer, maybe we get some uh, boost up. However, it starts decaying, or at the best, it will not change anything. So again, uh, we, when we are applying uh, deep learning, we need to see that whether increasing number of uh, layers, whether it is beneficial or not, or we are just increasing our training time. This one is even interesting. So I would repeat what we did here. So we trained the model in C sharp. However, we applied that trained model to Java samples to see whether the same trained model, how fairly or how good it is to classify Java samples into smelly and non-smelly code. And this is what we found. And again, it is a something similar trend, but if you compare this uh, direct training versus uh, transfer training, transfer learning, you will see that transfer learning is doing much better. So the model trained on C-sharp is better in detecting smells in Java code rather than its own code which is kind of surprising and I'm, I'm still looking why it's happening, honestly. But this is what we got. So this is what it is. Uh, let's conclude. Uh, the first conclusion that is that it is feasible to make deep learning model learn to detect smells. Obviously, which smell you are detecting and the performance varies and uh, we can do much more. That's a separate thing. Transfer learning is also feasible. We have seen that it is feasible. So what it implies that we, if, we, if you have a very good uh, tool for, for one language, one programming language, then you don't have to invent or write the tool for other programming languages, at least similar programming languages. You train the model and you apply that model to other programming languages. And obviously there are uh, many, many possibilities for uh, improvement. We can improve performance, we can uh, add more smells, different kind of smells, and, and this is, I believe, this is just a start, and uh, there are many, many things that can be built over it. So, these are some relevant links, as I promised. You can download all the source code and data here. I made it open source today morning. <laughs> you can download the uh, uh, the design at for C sharp here, and uh, for academic use it's free. For Java, it's open source project. You can do whatever you want. Code split is again uh, this Java version is open source. You can download and you can play with that. And for uh, for for C sharp, you can download freely without any charge. Tokenizer is another tool that we have offered and you can again uh, use it, it's an open source project, feel free to use it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> if, if you like uh, stickers, I have some stickers, some fancy stickers, please feel free. Yes, please. Yes.
okay what is what is the exact input to the convolution layer okay so the as you can see the architecture i mean uh, you uh, we have defined and before giving to the deep learning model to the whole uh, models we convert source code into tokens so yes tokens integer tokens but we have a numpy array basically which individual element is basically integer token and in 1d uh, 1d cnn 1d we have each input or for example each method is a single vector 1d vector in 2d cnn 2d we have the matrix so each input sample is a matrix 2d matrix yes, It doesn't remove. I think it's only the white spaces it removes. So, ah, so the question is that how uh, does the tokenizer work and how what it removes from the source code? So I think it doesn't remove anything. Uh, it just removes white spaces. And for each um, for each token, for example, public. Uh, it, I mean, the, if it is a reserved word, there is a set of tokens assigned to it. If it is a user-defined symbol, then there is a range of tokens uh, uh, on in which the it will be assignment will be made. And if it is a numerical literal, again it's a range of tokens which, which will be assigned to it. So something like. That. Framework dependent code. Okay. Uh, the question is uh, how it will work on framework dependent code. I don't see any difference between uh, framework dependent code or any, uh, otherwise, uh, but we have not tested it, so we have to. This is a very first attempt right now, so it's maybe maybe we can do that later. I don't think that will impact anything because uh, whatever code you provide, uh, I mean, and anyway, it's the, the the scope is very limited for the scan. So it's uh, for implementation, it's not just one method. So it's just looking that method. This. So what do you think are the main challenges to move this to scale this to sort of uh, more complex models like other functionality and things that are harder to do? Uh, it's it's. Ah, okay. Uh, the question is, w what are the challenges if we want to extend this work to more involved smells, more complex smells? For example, scattered functionality. It it is difficult. It is difficult because our goal was that we will not give the processed input to the model. We want to give model as as close to the raw uh, source code. We just tokenize it and remove the duplicates, but we didn't do anything else which normally referred as feature engineering. We didn't do that. And that's the one of the aim. We intentionally didn't do that because this is how we want to process it. But if we want to, if we want to go a little bit in detail and more uh, involved smells, and which we have seen in the multifaceted abstraction, it's, it's not really easy. The whole a characteristic of the smell is not captured really, and the model cannot capture even we given a training training size of ten thousand cannot capture that uh, 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 that is one possibility, but probably we need to do some sort of or mix uh, or introduce relevant features or give relevant features uh, to to help the model to detect better. When is it useful to have this deep learning algorithm, uh, the accuracy of natural language processing is above 95% right, right now, to detect the smell? When do you consider it useful? At what accuracy level is the goal for the industry? <coughs> the qu <laughs> the qu question is that, uh, is it ready for the industry? If I summarize it, what or at what level? Accuracy is it useful? 
Okay, for the industry, what kind of accuracy will be needed to, yeah. so that we can say, okay, now it's ready for industry? Yeah. Hmm. That's uh, difficult to answer, but in, in the morning, we one of the uh, sessions, we say that the precision is really important for this kind of analysis. So if we have a precision, a lower precision, like uh, less than 70, 80%, then people will reject it uh, very outrageously. So it must have something decent precision, and because this is not really uh, a life-threatening, uh, if we miss something, it's not life-threatening. So we can compromise on precision, but we cannot, no, sorry, recall, but not on precision. Because otherwise, if precision is very high, which means false positives are very high, which means us. Uh, if precision is low, then high, false positive is very high, which means people will say, mm, out of 10, only one is useful. I don't want to use it. So a decent percentage could be at least 80, 85. There is no gold rule for that, but something like that. Great. So thank you very much.